Welcome back, back with another banger. It's the React Files. Hope you're having a good night. If you haven't already, please take a second just to smash that like, subscribe, ring that notification bell, just to make sure the algorithm knows what's up. So let's get straight to it. Check this out, you guys. Hollow Earth may be a real thing. Scientists have discovered a massive ocean, a huge, extensive reservoir that's three times the size of all the oceans on the planet put together. They have determined that all the water that's on the surface of the Earth is actually coming from inside of the Earth, y'all. Check this out. Scientists have found an ocean under the Earth's surface, a massive one of that. Sounds staggering, right? Let me tell you all about it. The discovery has been made some 700 kilometers deep into the Earth. The ocean lies just above the lower mantle in something called the Mantle Transition Zone. The water is present in a rock known as Ringwoodite. And do you know how big this ocean is? About three times the volume of all the planet's oceans combined. So if you take all of the Earth's oceans and triple them, that is the amount of water discovered inside the Earth. Now the question is, how does this water get there? Was it present when our planet was formed or did it appear due to some process that happened later? Now according to the findings presented in a 2014 scientific paper, the water cycle extends deep into the Earth's interior. Scientists believe the oceanic crust slides under adjoining plates of crust and sinks into the mantle, carrying water with it. They have now concluded that there is a mantle transition zone that acts as a large reservoir of water. That is because the minerals in this zone have a high water storage capacity. Consider ringwoodite. The rock in which the ocean has been found, it has a crystal structure that attracts hydrogen. It is basically like a sponge which soaks up water. Researchers also studied earthquakes to make this discovery. They deployed an extensive network of 2,000 2000 seismographs across the U.S. and scrutinized seismic waves emitted by over 500 earthquakes. You see these waves traveling through Earth's inner layers experience deceleration when passing through damp rock. And this indicated that there is indeed an extensive water reservoir inside planet Earth. Now that the ocean has been unearthed, it challenges our understanding of the source of Earth's water. All this while we thought water circulated between the atmosphere surface water bodies and the underground water table but we never knew that it was present deep inside the earth as well how does it affect the cycling of water do we need to redraw the water cycles in our textbooks the scientific endeavor behind this revelation was led by stephen jacobson a researcher at Northwestern University, he now asserts that there is significant evidence supporting that Earth's water originated internally. Crazy, huh? Or not crazy. As above, so below. As within, so without. Everything comes from within, right? Yeah, this is how you look in the physical, but what's inside of you internally? What's working inside of you internally? You have billions of beings inside of you working internally. Wouldn't that be the same case for the Earth as well? So, does this also prove Atlantis and mermaids and hollow earth, right? Wouldn't there people be living inside of the earth because water is life? That's civilization. Again, the age of Aquarius is bringing out all the truth, y'all. All the truth to the surface. What do you guys think about this video? This video is strictly for entertainment purposes only. I am only raising awareness to interesting situations during these interesting times. Like, comment, and share for more videos like this. Thank you for tuning to my frequency. Let's get this shift. Peace in. Shout out to Conscious Juice. Breaking the news. Yeah, this sounds a lot like King Kong. I say it all the time. Hollow Earth. And where there is water, there is life. So there's got to be some kind of beings down there. All this time, I thought there was like lava in the center of the Earth. You know? I thought it was hot down there. They're saying that there's water. So I agree. We definitely have to change up them textbooks. Are you using your toes? Yeah, I'm using my toes. I 
can't, I'm never going to the cave again. I'm done. It's tight, man. It's going to be tight. I'm trying to do the tickets out a little bit so I can slide through. Just a little move. My moist, warm dog intestine. I definitely would not do something like that at all. My anxiety would go through the roof. The internet was created originally by an organization called DARPA. DARPA is the technological development arm of the Pentagon. I would call DARPA evil, except it might sue me for defamation, or evil might sue me for defamation of character. Um, it's a sinister organization for which we can thank uh, for death rays and endless um, new ways of killing people uh, in larger and larger numbers without damaging the furniture. The idea, and this is all connected to the, to the smart technology and all the technologies that are coming in and, and artificial intelligence, they had to get the internet to a point where it was the central pillar of human society. The central pillar of where all our information came, came from, the central pillar of control, this is why we now have the Internet of Things, where billions of uh, um, uh, pieces of technology, everything from your fridge to your car to your telly, are connected to the, to the uh, Internet. Uh, but to reach that point, it had to be what's, what people wanted. And people go, this is great. Um, you know, this is fantastic, and it became, you know, the center pillar of human society. And of course, in that initial period where they were selling it, people like me and so many other people had the platform uncensored to, to get information out there, and it was great. And I'm sure, you know, your, your DARPAs and all the connected organizations to DARPA were, were kind of, you know, spitting through their teeth. But it, they had to do it to get the internet to where they wanted. In the same way, when your Facebook started and your Googles and your Twitters and your, your Amazons with the books, they would not have reached this point they've reached of near monopoly um, if they'd have been censoring as they are now from the start. Instead, they did exactly the same thing. No censorship, say what you like, and people then became addicted to Facebook and Google became by far the, the biggest search engine. It's a few manipulating so many. The only way that you can achieve that is by controlling the perceptions of the many and by dividing and ruling the many as well. But you've got to control the perceptions of the many. And to do that, you control information. And what's, um, what this process of the internet and these internet uh, giants near monopolies, uh, that process can be simply explained. And it can be explained why um, up to relatively recently the internet was censorship free, my god not anymore, and why your Facebooks and your Googles and Twitters and stuff and Amazons were censorship free and now suddenly they aren't. This is the process towards that goal of complete control of information, thus complete control of human perception, thus control of human behavior. This is the, the process. So now we're in a position of power and strength. Now the internet's gonna become what it was always planned to be. Now Facebook and Google and Twitter and Amazon are now gonna be what they're always planned to be, which were gate, gatekeepers on what on the information that people can see and hear. Shout outs to the third eye zone. He was definitely on point. 
Sounds like he was speaking a lot of truth right there. Laws is a type of military application that removes a human in the loop. With the help of artificial intelligence, the AI takes control of the weapon and performs the desired actions. Lethal autonomous weapon systems are being developed to be used by militaries with the intention of removing human soldiers from conflict. The La gap between the things robots and humans can do is closing at an alarming rate. As humanity continues to push the limits of what is possible with AI, a lot of understandably concerned industry leaders have spoken out about the dangers of going too far with technology and artificial intelligence. The main fear on every expert's mind is that we are quickly approaching a singularity or a point of no return in which technological developments become so advanced that the effects on society are irreversible and completely uncontrollable. One company whose robots have literally been making leaps and bounds of progress is Boston Dynamics, the creator of the most advanced humanoid robots known to man. Keep watching to learn why Boston Dynamics' most recent updates on Atlas were so shocking to investors and industry leaders and what this could mean for the future of AI and the world at large. For viewers who don't know, Atlas is the name that Boston Dynamics gave to the humanoid robot that the company has been developing with funding from the U.S. government and the Department of Defense since 2011. According to MIT, the original plan for the project was to design a robot that could perform the most difficult, dangerous, and high-stakes jobs with perfect accuracy and without the need for human intervention. These tasks would include tending to a nuclear reactor during a meltdown, shutting off a deep water oil spill, or helping to put out a raging wildfire. If Atlas could prove that it was useful for dangerous and difficult tasks, then it could be integrated into society to perform very important daily activities such as caring for the elderly and ill. Boston Dynamics is known for creating cutting-edge robots that can be used in a wide variety of settings. For example, they invented a dog-like robot called Spot, meant to navigate extreme terrain and capture data in places that are hard to reach for humans, especially for routine inspection tasks. The company also developed a robot called Cheetah, capable of running at almost 30 miles per hour. Although a lot of their robots and projects have been tested by the U.S. military, Boston Dynamics claims that the purpose of these robots is only humanitarian, and that if they have been used in military settings, it's only so the robots can eventually be used in search and rescue missions and to replace humans in dangerous jobs in extreme weather and environmental conditions. Even though Boston Dynamics has invented a wide range of bots over the past couple of decades, Atlas is by far their most important project. The progress that the Massachusetts-based engineering company has made with this robot over the last 10 years is like something out of a science fiction movie. The first prototype for Atlas came into being right after the Fukushima nuclear accident in 2011, which was a very humbling moment for the robotics industry. During the incident, the Department of Defense actually did deploy some humanoid robots to help with the nuclear disaster, but the robot couldn't maneuver around basic obstacles and ended up being more of a burden than an actual help. This was the moment that the Department of Defense decided to increase its financial support for Boston Dynamics in order to create a robot that could assist in these types of extreme situations and could eventually be used in healthcare settings. The first prototypes for Atlas looked pretty much how you would expect. Clunky, awkward, heavy, and not very attractive. It could perform basic tasks such as carrying heavy loads from one point to another and walk on narrow ledges, but it was still a long way away from being a robot that people could depend on to help in real, life-threatening situations. Fast forward 10 years later, and now Atlas can be seen in videos showing off a sleek, elegant design, dancing to classic tunes, carrying 80 kilogram loads with ease at over six miles an hour, doing somersaults and backflips, navigating extreme terrain and jumping over obstacles, and most recently, tossing around tool bags around a construction site. Boston Dynamics has been releasing videos on their progress on Atlas for 10 years now, and it's really cool to see just how far they've come with this robot. The most recent update that shocked viewers and investors was the robot's gripper claws that Atlas now uses to skillfully pick up irregular objects and use them to complete difficult obstacle courses. For example, in the last video uploaded by Boston Dynamics, Atlas can be seen carefully setting down a wooden plank to use as a bridge between the boxes it was using as steps and the platform that it has to cross to throw a tool bag to the construction worker at the top of the platform. One of the most amazing things about this robot is that before, it had to be fully controlled by humans to do even the most simple things, and it even had to be tethered to a cooling water source and to a power source. Now, Atlas is equipped with what is known in engineering as a Model Predictive Controller, or MPC, which means that it doesn't have to be trained to react accurately to every single possible scenario. The engineers at Boston Dynamics only have to teach it how to do one type of movement, and then Atlas can adapt to similar situations and handle them by making slight variations 
reactions to its movements. In the words of Pat Marion, an engineer at Boston Dynamics, jumping off a 52 centimeter platform isn't that different from a 40 centimeter one, and we can trust MPC to figure out the details. But how is this even possible? Well, we won't get too deep into the tech details, but it's enough to say that Atlas is packed with the most cutting edge technology in the robotics industry. For example, if Atlas had to figure out how to jump from a 10 inch wide wooden beam to a box that was 12 inches higher, it uses distance sensors and reflective technology called LiDAR to understand Understand the type of movement required to get from one obstacle to the next, and then it selects a movement from its behavior library, which is a collection of thousands and thousands of templates created ahead of time. This is probably one of the coolest things that has ever been done in robotics because companies like Boston Dynamics are paving the way towards completely autonomous robots. A few years back, engineers would have to program a robot to do a very basic sequence of movements, and any changes to its environment would probably make the robot fall over or crash into an obstacle because robots did not have the ability to make advanced decisions based on perception. Now, robots like Atlas can make big adjustments to their movement patterns when they perceive changes in their environment. In other words, robots are now being taught to think for themselves, and this could have amazing effects on society, but it could also be a huge safety concern. Some tech channels have released videos of semi-autonomous robots moving through extreme terrain and firing guns with perfect accuracy at their targets, claiming that these robots were developed by Boston Dynamics. There's even a video in which a human soldier is standing next to a decoy of himself, and a robot has to tell the difference between the human and the non-human target, and then shoot the non-human target. Although Boston Dynamics released a statement claiming Claiming that these videos are completely fake and these robots are not being developed by the company, similar technology already exists and it wouldn't be impossible to use Atlas as a template for future robot soldiers. For example, the Department of Defense announced in February 2023 that an AI bot had successfully flown a fighter jet over California for over 17 hours. In the US as well as in other countries, the technology for fully autonomous drones and unmanned aircraft is already being developed for military purposes and the French Army has also been using Boston Dynamics spot robot dog in combat situations. Although Boston Dynamics has always claimed that the purpose of their robots is to help people with dangerous and tedious tasks and not to be put into combat situations, the truth is that we are not far away at all from fully autonomous combat robots. The dangerous part of this is that if enemy hackers could somehow find a way to override the programming on robots like the ones Boston Dynamics makes, they could be used as weapons of destruction. Eventually, Boston Dynamics could be pressured by the US government to let them use their technology for military purposes, because if other countries are developing autonomous combat robots, and the US is not, it could mean big trouble. It's difficult to tell how soon we could be looking at fully autonomous military robots, because on the one hand, companies like Boston Dynamics have been developing robots that have been tested in military situations for over 15 years, such as their robot mule named Big Dog, which can carry heavy loads under extreme conditions for hours on end. Their technology has now been military tested by other countries as well, and with China following so closely in the AI race, it's hard not to think of a future with robot soldiers taking over tasks that were previously only performed by humans. On the other hand, Boston Dynamics has always claimed that their robots are not for military use, so there's definitely some mixed messages here and plenty of room for confusion and worry. Sometimes it can be difficult to know where exactly all of these technological developments are taking us. Will humanoid robots be used as a force for good, or will they also be weaponized and turned into autonomous killing machines? Will they replace policemen for good, or will they just be used for additional support? Is the singularity near? Are we safe? With so much uncertainty, all of these questions are just begging to be answered, and there's really only one thing that we know for certain. For better or worse, robots have already made permanent and irreversible changes in society, and it's up to us to make the best choices as to how to use this technology as a force for good. Otherwise, the consequences could be disastrous. Shoutouts to Blue Light Technology. That gap is closing quickly. Now, I wouldn't mind having a robot to do the dishes and clean up the kitchen. Shout out to NPR on getting that footage right there. Look like they occupied the hall. They took over the building. So exactly 56 years ago, on April 30th, 1968, 
Columbia students protesting racism against black people in the Vietnam War while occupying that same exact hall. That place is historic. Is history repeating itself? I don't know. If anything, it looks like it's gotten worse. Our three demands from the very beginning were, first of all, total divestment yes. from any uh, any company that profits off of Israeli genocide or apartheid. Mm -hmm. Second of all, we want full financial transparency about the university's investments. Yes. This is information that should be easy to get. The university is hiding it because they know it makes them look bad. And the third thing is total amnesty for anybody who's been disciplined or fired in relation to their actions in the movement for Palestinian liberation. So that means, you know, we're both at risk of suspension. Yeah. Uh, we don't deserve to be suspended. We're living out the values that we were taught um, in our studies here. So uh, we both just got emails uh, from Barnard saying that we are interim, interim suspended. suspended. And uh, for what? What's the charge? I mean, yesterday they, they came in, a few Barnard administrators came in and warned everybody um, saying that if we didn't disperse, they would, what, what was it? Uh, that we would be interim deactivate, suspended. Yeah. I, they and would deactivate our IDs by 9 p.m., which didn't happen. I was able to use my ID this morning, but I guess it kicked in just now. Yeah, I yeah. guess they uh, they decided to go through with it, but... I thought they were bluffing, actually, because this morning when my ID worked, I was like, okay. Uh, but you guys are still staying. Oh, no, we're going to stay. Yeah, we're staying. Bro, oh, they, they can like, expel me and I'll they, stay. They can suspend every single one of us and we'll still be here. <laughs> they can put us in jail, we'll come back, put you tent again. Like, yeah. We're not leaving. I heard this is also like the designated protest, like this is where people go to protest on campus. <laughs> yeah, is but we didn't book the designated yeah. demonstration zone, so... So that warrants suspension? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bureaucracy! Wow! This isn't the first time Columbia University students were arrested for protesting war. In the 1960s, Columbia University students led a historic protest that ended in mass arrests. You know, we often talk about democracy, but when it comes to institutions like the workplace or the schools, suddenly only those uh, in power have the right to make decisions. Journalist Juan Gonzalez was a student leader at Columbia during the protest that shut down the school for a week. It's very similar to what is happening here today. The young people, not just in the United States, but around the world, have been seeing now for months this unfolding genocide uh, occurring in uh, Palestine and with very little response by the world community. Back in 1968, students were protesting the Vietnam War, which would go on to kill 3.8 million Vietnamese people and some 58,000 Americans. At Columbia, hundreds demonstrated after learning the school secretly partnered with a Washington think tank that conducted military weapons research. After a week of protesting, Columbia called in city police, who ended up arresting more than 700 students and injured over 100. We occupied and barricaded five buildings. We prevented classes from uh, uh, going forth. You were a senior at, at a university in the United States in the spring of 1968. The last thing on your mind was what kind of job are you going to get when you graduated? When police cracked down, some of the arrests were violent and chaotic. Images of the police brutality made national news. In the end, the university broke ties with the think tank. And across the U.S., protests erupted nationwide from students rebelling against the Vietnam War. Just like in the 1960s, Colombia's 2024 protests have spread to other schools in the country. But Gonzalez points out a noticeable difference. The universities now are crushing this dissent, this peaceful dissent, with uh, larger consequences. Over 100 students from Columbia University and Barnard College were arrested and then suspended for peacefully protesting the war in Gaza. And outside of New York, U.S. universities have suspended and, in some cases, permanently expelled students for speaking out. Police have now arrested hundreds of students, along with some faculty members. Can you call the philosophy department office and tell them I've been requested? Even after we took our actions, the university back then at least offered us uh, due process. They called us into disciplinary hearings. We had the right to defend ourselves. And it's just astounding to me uh, that uh, claims of feeling uh, insecure because of what people are saying are eclipsing the reality of the bombs and the weapons that are being dropped on the Palestinian people.
Israeli attacks have killed over 34,000 Palestinians since October. Over the last seven months of Israel's relentless bombing, the U.S. has approved more than 100 weapons sales to Israel. Students at Columbia want the school to cut ties with U.S. companies that benefit from Israel's attacks on Gaza. In response to the student protests, Columbia's president issued a statement declaring that the school will not divest. I know that Columbia has invested in companies like Boeing, which makes the bombs that are dropping as, uh, as we speak. Gonzalez, who was also arrested and suspended as a result of the 1968 protests, urges the current demonstrators to remain steadfast. They represent the best of American democracy. The most important thing is having the courage to stand up and uh, defy what you believe to be unjust policy. Is a badge that you carry for, with you for the rest of your life. Shout out to Mr. Gonzalez, the OG. I feel like it's bigger now than it was back then. It was crazy to see that professor getting arrested. Everybody getting arrested, like God. Last night at Columbia University, an autonomous group of students took Hamilton hall and i want to talk about it first and foremost i think what a lot of people are missing is just like the historic significance of hamilton hall when it comes to student protesting so let me go through it really quickly we start in 1968 and i made another video kind of tying in the 1968 protest this is a super historic protest columbia literally has a class um, I took a class called American Social Movements taught by the same professor who teaches a class called Columbia 1968. It's literally a course at Columbia in the history department because of how significant this specific protest was. Today, you know Columbia is like celebrating these protesters when at the time they obviously treated them horrendously. This protest was discussing the Vietnam War and also a segregated gym, um, which was further gentrifying Morningside. Police entered Hamilton Hall through underground tunnels and beat protesters with batons, with nightsticks, dragged protesters down the stairs, down concrete stairs. Over 700 students were um, arrested. The second time we have Hamilton Hall occupied by students in protest is in 1972. It's another anti-war protest. No students are arrested at this one. 1985 students padlock and chain themselves to Hamilton Hall, calling for Columbia to divest from apartheid South Africa. We know how that went down. We know how history looks at that time. And you know what Columbia did at the end of that year? They completely divested from South Africa. 1992, we have, I think this is the fourth, if I'm counting correctly, um, time where students are occupying Hamilton Hall. This is in protest of the theater where Malcolm X was assassinated, was going to become a science research center and students were protesting that. 1996, we see a hunger strike and also four days of students occupying Hamilton Hall to protest the creation of an ethnic studies department. You know, my advisor at Columbia, what department is he the head of? The Center for Ethnic Studies, because four years later it was created and it is a massive department at Columbia University. So let's take it back to last night when students began occupying Hamilton Hall. They're still occupying it this very moment. They renamed it Hind Hall after six-year-old Hind. And I think the bravery, the courage that it takes and the fact that we know history is on our side. In the future, Columbia will try to co-op this moment. They will have a plaque, they will have a memorial, they will talk about it, there will be a course after it, but what are they doing in this moment? The students haven't been wrong yet and the students united will never be defeated. Yo, shout out to Taylor Ray Almonte. Spitting the facts, the history. Yo, I didn't know the history with Columbia and Hamilton Hall went that deep. I knew there was some stuff in the 60s, but she just named like five points where something like this has happened. My condolences to the family of the little girl. I feel like this is a historic moment in history right now. I don't think we're realizing it.
But one day this will be in the textbooks. There's a conspiracy that's so intricate that it's gained a cult following. I've heard of it, and so have you, but it's getting out of hand. Nine months ago, a post appeared on Reddit. It asks the question, does the Simpsons predict the future? From predicting the 2020 election of Donald Trump to Lady Gaga's Super Bowl halftime show, the question in this post has been asked many times. Something really bothered me about this post with zero upvotes. The responses to the latter half. It was a catastrophic flood of deranged theories, responses based around the idea of a new world order, explaining that The Simpsons is the vessel used by the ruling elite to tell us what's coming. And it wasn't just this thread. The dialogue is everywhere. The show's creator is a Freemason, Jeffrey Epstein, September 11th. These theories are endless, but they still leave the question open. The predictions. How are they doing? You've probably heard the conspiracy theory that the Simpsons can predict everything about the future. Who are the world's greatest Accurate prophets? predictions. They predicted the future. Some of these predictions are clearly surface level. Others are alarmingly sophisticated. So for the past four months, we've been searching for an answer, one that will finally satisfy us. We listened to common theories and we had assumptions of our own. We went the extra mile, collecting data that we couldn't find on the internet, hiring statisticians and interviewing experts. At times, it felt ridiculous. But when we ran the numbers, one explanation stood above the rest. So everyone is wrong. One that was left out of the mainstream narrative almost entirely. This video was meant to be a counterbalance to the flood of derangement, but it turned out to be the kind of thing that makes you stop, look at yourself in the mirror and say, holy shit. This is a story about the undeniable humor of our reality and how the human brain interprets the world around us. What is the mind? Is it just a system of impulses or is it something tangible? Doggy. Good dog. What is mind? No matter. What is matter? Never mind. You know, I've owned this mic for years, and this is my first time using it. Fuck. That opening was pretty dramatic. I'm sorry. But I had to. For real, the story's super interesting. I want to show you. For years, even the mainstream news has been asking how, and they seem to have come up with the most simple explanation. So that's where we started. The Simpsons predicted part one. The Simpsons predicting the future. Their explanation is based off a quote from an assistant math professor. Assistant math professor at the University of Albany. Here's how the logic goes. The Simpsons is one of the longest running shows of all time. In 29 seasons, 120,000 jokes. 8.54 jokes per minute. They say it's just a numbers game. This only comes out to about a 1.6% success rate. The chalk's too big. They compare it to Star Trek, which has had a similar number of episodes. Star Trek comprises over 760 episodes of television and 13 feature films. Star Trek has also predicted the future. Wait a second. What other television show has over 700 episodes? So these shows have just had more opportunity to be right. And with that many predictions, they essentially just got lucky. They argue that there's nothing special about The Simpsons predicting the future because other shows have done it too. It's luck. I was disappointed too, until we took a closer look. The theory rests on this foundation alone. That the two shows have a similar number of episodes and that they have a similar number of accurate predictions. But that's not true. The Simpsons have had more predictions come true than other shows. Like, by a lot. The answer really feels like it's missing something. Like it's only half of the explanation. Transporter room energized. And look at this. Star Trek predicted shit like flip phones. Prepare to beam Scotty on board. Flat screen TVs. They're really easy to dismiss as coincidence, luck, whatever you want to call it. From Star Trek, it's all of them. And The Simpsons, they have some of these too. Video calls, autocorrect. The coincidence explanation makes sense here. These shallow predictions don't merit screaming headlines. Nobody's talking about them. Certainly not Reddit. They don't make it to the conspiracy boards. Those boards are focused on things that are more elaborate and intricate, alarmingly sophisticated predictions. The reason that the it's a numbers game narrative feels like only half of the truth is because it is. The mainstream theory is answering a question that no one is asking. 
scientists believe they are getting closer to proving the existence of the Higgs boson, the hypothetical subatomic particle thought to supply mass to the matter that makes up our universe. An experiment is to resume Wednesday at the Large Hadron Collider near Geneva, designed to catch a glimpse of the so-called God particle. In 2012, scientists at CERN discovered the missing God particle, a previously unknown building block of our universe, today known as the Higgs boson. It fundamentally changes our understanding of the universe. It's a massive discovery for quantum physics. There's nothing else like the Higgs in nature. This is a completely new kind of... Scientists believe that without the Higgs, there would be no gravity and no universe. Fifteen years earlier, in a 1998 episode, Homer wrote this equation on the blackboard. To viewers, it meant nothing. It was absolute jargon. At that stage, um, so this is a long time ago, um, nobody knew the mass of the Higgs boson. Nobody even knew if it existed. The equation predicted the mass of the missing God particle so precisely that he was only this far off. This breakthrough in understanding the origins of mass... 15 whole years before it was discovered. What? <laughs> This scene is by far the most specific prediction The Simpsons has made, to a shocking level of accuracy. The question we're asking, the question that's been asked for 30 years, the answer to this whole video, it must be buried in this one scene. The first equation on the board is an attempt to estimate the mass of the Higgs boson. And as a particle physicist, that resonated with me. We're gonna do the math, bitch. Are you serious? I made my friend Mia watch a hundred episodes of The Simpsons, randomly picked from all seasons. I couldn't get over it. It's not like the government is listening to everybody's conversation. Edward Snowden's NSA spying scandal. They made the prediction five years before it even came true. Trump's presidency, 17 years. We've inherited quite a budget crunch from President Trump. Disney buys Fox, 19 years. Statue of David censorship, 26 years. Okay, it's not a deep state plot, and it's not by chance. The show's executive producer, Al Jean, says that they're somehow predicting these intentionally. Emmy award-winning producer, writer, worked on The Simpsons uh, since the start in 1989. One overwhelming factor that determines the content of the show is that we are produced a year in advance, like the clip I just showed. Um, we're actually amateur futurologists. How the fuck are they doing this? Okay, I've got all the numbers. I counted every time the show had a joke or had a plot device that had the potential to come true. Mia's discoveries were worthy of reshaping how I perceive the word prediction. Up until now, I've been seeing this whole spectrum as predictions, but it's really not fair to say that this is the same as this. Nine bucks? This one's on me. There was one crazy cell where Bart held up a brochure that is New York on $9 a day. The World Trade Center. This was 1996. It was in the background, so it looked like 9-11. That was insane, and of course unplanned. It was a terrible coincidence. That was Al Jean, the show's current executive producer and former showrunner. Conspiracy theorists online claim that this is proof that the deep state masterminds behind the show knew of 9-11 five years in advance. The episode is completely absent of anything to do with the attack. It's a magazine with the New York skyline. That's a coincidence. According to the internet, there's 43 predictions that The Simpsons got right. But I think 13 of them are coincidences. Looking at the other 30 predictions, with a degree of like 95% confidence and a P-score around like 0.11, I think it's clear that she said a bunch of other shit that totally went above my head. It made me realize that we needed to get a real professional involved. This other part of the spectrum, with 30 examples unexplained by coincidence, what does it mean? I reached out to a statistician on Fiverr, but they turned out to be a bot impersonating a crypto influencer. Thanks, Fiverr. But luckily, Mia knew a real professional, so here's what they said. They were rolling on both lines. Okay, go for it. Predicting the future is notoriously difficult, so the fact that The Simpsons has managed to do it 30 times could be seen as statistically significant. And compared to other shows like Star Trek, Futurama, South Park, The Simpsons does stand out. Holy shit. So everyone is wrong. How? My name's Simon Singh. I live in London, and uh, gosh, I suppose for 
15, 20 years I've been writing books about mathematics and physics. Simon wrote a book about The Simpsons too, but he's being humble here. He's a theoretical and particle physicist. He contributed to other discoveries at CERN where the Higgs boson was discovered. If there's one person that has the answer, it's him. When you have such a long running show that covers so many different topics, there are bound to be things that, 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 that turn out to be true in due course. Part of getting it right is luck, but the big ones, the ones that are impossible to explain by coincidence, the ones that spark up conspiracies on Reddit, those are not predictions at all. So I got in touch with, with the, 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 the writer of that episode, um, David X. Cohen. Now David X. Cohen did a degree in physics and then did a master's degree in computer science and then had published papers in mathematical journals. So he, he was a smart guy. He loved math and he loved physics. And so he wanted to create this equation and put it on the board. So he rang up his friend, David Shaminovich, uh, who was a professor at Columbia. They, they'd been at high school together. He said to David Shaminovich, could you concoct an equation that would somehow give the right result? All right. I'm not going to use anecdotal evidence from just one example as a cop-out conclusion here. While Mia was working on her research, I came across something interesting. We have our distinguished panel members with us. They are award-winning writers and producers of The Simpsons. Our panelists also hold an impressive array of degrees in mathematics, computer science, and philosophy, among others. The other thing is you could assemble a panel of other kinds of nerds from The Simpsons as well. Like, like there are millions of jokes about the presidents of the United States. For example, I'm looking at Patrick Verone, who's a presidential <laughs> scholar. But really, there's a lot of people with different interests, and they're all trying to cram all this stuff in. Unlike most other shows, The Simpsons writing team consists largely of writers who are extremely educated in fields ranging from mathematics to social sciences. And because of this, they're also really connected to those that are on the cutting edge. Let me play this back. So he rang up his friend, David Shaminovich, uh, who was a professor at Columbia. They, they'd been at high school together. But they didn't just know each other from high school. Together, they formed a gang of teenage computer programmers called the Glitch Masters. They even wrote their own computer language. And after after studying physics at Harvard, Cohen rejected a career in academia to pursue writing. Shaminovich was just one of many connections of his in the field. You got the math people today, but this same panel could be going on in thousands of locations at the same time on different subjects. You know, when, when they came up with the equation for the Higgs boson, they could have come up with any old clutch of Greek symbols. Uh, but no, they picked genuine physical constants when combined in the right way, gave a mass of the Higgs boson that was plausible. So they sort of said, you know, whenever we put mathematics into the show, we've got to get it right. But we'll make sure it's true, we'll make sure it's accurate. This mindset goes beyond math for the writers of The Simpsons. These aren't just random things. These are equations that have a lot of thought put into them before they appear on screen. Earlier in this video, I claimed that the equation on the blackboard was precise. He was only this far off. But this amount of error on the particle level is incredibly significant. They were way off. From a particle physics point of view, it's not a very good equation. The content on the blackboard was put there by a writer who had a pulse on mathematics. Something that's just not in the public eye. It wasn't even a prediction. It was a corny joke poking fun at something very real and very absurd in true satire fashion. It's a pattern, and it explains these. This sounds like political presidential talk to me, and I know people have talked to you about whether or not you want to run. I do get tired of seeing what's happening with this country, and if it got so bad, I would never want to rule it out totally. Trump hinted at the presidency 12 years before The Simpsons made this episode. President Trump. Yet again, a corny joke poking fun at something very real and very absurd. But this joke is making fun of something that's not in the public eye. Would you, would you ever? Probably not. Why would you not? I just don't think I really have the inclination to do it. I love what I'm doing. I really like it. Also, I, it doesn't pay as well. No, nah, it doesn't. <laughs> so here's the whole truth. We can finally put it to rest. The Simpsons are not predicting the future. It's just intricate writing. I was left with the question, why? Why put all this effort in? So I got my hands dirty. I scraped the web for all of the data that I could find, and I compared it to Mia's findings. Hundreds of lines of code later, the answer revealed itself. Here's a chart of all of the accurate predictions made by The Simpsons, sorted by season. We found data that someone else collected, which I linked in the description. But using it, we found that it takes about 13 years for The Simpsons predictions to come true, on average. If you look closely, a pattern emerges. A pattern that follows the user rating of each episode. 
the show is a satire on American culture. They're making fun of us. That's kind of the whole point, right? Good writing is socially, politically, scientifically aware. The writers want this. Not only is it more fun for them, but it makes the show more interesting for us. At least, according to IMDb. Here's my final case. It looks messy, but stick with me. Each of these lines is one writer for The Simpsons. Some only wrote one season, and they never came back. Others wrote, and they took a break for several seasons, but they returned. In his book, The Simpsons and Their Mathematical Secrets, Simon includes a list of some of the writers with extensive degrees. What do you think? Do the predictions mostly happen when these writers are around? One of the things about jokes and probably philosophy and perhaps math is that um, once you're done with them, they seem like they were obvious all along. A 2001 episode involved Homer attempting to prevent his local baseball team, the Isotopes, from moving to Albuquerque. Two years later, the Albuquerque minor league team was named the Isotopes. The town held a vote to determine the name of the team. The team president even admitted that the name came from the series. Our explanation is not a catch-all. There's a few unique exceptions here. Laws of statistics are weird and they can make some truly absurd coincidences happen. New York City has a population of around 9 million people, and with that many people, a one in a million event should happen nine times a day there. As always, there's room for disagreement. I hope I made a compelling argument. I really did feel a little bit silly making this video, but I posted a promo for it, and after seeing some of the comments that came out, I was genuinely concerned. Conspiracy theories can be a real problem, and seeing them proliferate, it's not something that I love. I don't fault people for mistaking complexity for conspiracy, especially because conspiracies can be fun, but often the truth can be even better. Thanks for watching. Yeah, that was great. Shout outs to Truths underscore Uncover for posting that. I don't know who that guy was, but he went down a true rabbit hole for real, and he did the math. Yeah, that was great. So many writers and they're here one season and gone the next. And I think it stuck out to me that at the end of the day, they're poking fun at us for their entertainment. And we're watching, you know, just as amused. That was very ironic. So yeah, very interesting. You have the absolute right to free speech in America. You can protest, uh, but the First Amendment does not give you the right to break windows, uh, to vandalize buildings, uh, to take over private buildings, and to make students who happen to be of Jewish descent feel unsafe. Those things are not protected by the First Amendment. And so the folks who are protesting need to understand that line. And when they cross that line, then universities have every right uh, to take action against those students. And that's a wrap. Hope you enjoyed tonight's rabbit hole. If you haven't already, please take a second just to smash that like. Subscribe. Ring that notification bell. Just to make sure the algorithm knows what's up. So what are we gonna do, y'all? That's right. Run these numbers up. Thanks again. Until next time.